Okay, so we are here at the uh, Utah State Capitol. And, you know, in recent years, there's sort of been a race around digital governance and blockchain, various states racing to compete to be the innovators in that space. And you've got Colorado, which is way up there, and Texas is chasing that, and Wyoming, and Utah in itself is quite a leader in the uh, digital government space. They, they're putting a lot of resources into digital technology governance and recently uh, working on uh, legislation around digital assets and cryptocurrency regulation and uh, looking into uh, digital identity as well and privacy, uh, the digital identity privacy working group. Uh, Phil Windley at Brigham Young University has been working in the digital identity space for about at least 15 years or so, um, is, is working on this uh, data privacy commission. And so it's important to understand because in stakeholder capitalism, it's all about the public-private partnerships. And so in order for private capital to access dispossessed communities through education, healthcare, housing, food assistance, they actually need the government as the intermediary. And that's been somewhat of a challenge, conveying that to maybe more conservative or libertarian leaning groups, thinking that, you know, that somehow the government is going to get out of everybody's business. But really, the government is the access point for the global capital. It is a, a, is a handshake agreement. And so that the governments make the legislation that allow the pay for success partnerships to advance. And that's very central. So I want to speak a little bit to Mitt Romney, who's, you know, the new senator. You know, he came from Massachusetts. He was governor of Massachusetts. And, you know, for all intents and purposes of, you know, sense of being liberal, Massachusetts is incredibly neoliberal. <laughs> and a lot of the, the technology that we're dealing with is coming out of the Boston area, World War II commercialization of military technology that led to the creation of Silicon Valley. So all of that is still being baked in in Harvard and MIT. And uh, Romney was part of that whole mix for a, you know, a very long time. And being attached to Bain Capital, the consulting firm, uh, that, that is very much key. And Bain has a spinoff called Bridgespan. And Bridgespan would do consulting work to uh, nonprofits, government institutions, cultural institutions to sort of tee them up for this new reality, which was social impact finance. And we saw that in our school district in Philadelphia. Uh, but Bridgespan was doing work nationally and even internationally. And so the, the presence of Bain and Bridgespan and impact investing is really important so that when Romney took Orrin Hatch's seat, Orrin Hatch actually was a, a key lobbyist for the Social Impact Partnerships Pay for Results Act, CIPRA. And uh, I actually, I went to the, the kickoff for the CIPRA event a number of years ago at the Dirksen Senate building. And he was a key player in, in lining all of that up and, and setting up the committees and bringing in people from the Sorensen in Impact Center here in Salt Lake City into the mix of this, this CIPRA organization. Um, and those, those social impact partnerships are going to be what the pay for success deals are run on. So that's, that's important to remember in, t in terms of context. So I just wanted to say a few words about the, the Romney family, George Romney. Uh, in Philadelphia in 1997, there was a gathering on Independence Mall and it was organized by Harris Wofford, who was a Pennsylvania state senator, and he was connected previously to, uh, he was an assistant, a high-level aide to uh, JFK. And he brought together all of the living presidents on uh, Independence Mall for a youth summit. And this youth summit was actually set up at the request of George Romney, who had, had died, but it was sort of, I guess, his deathbed wish that this youth summit happened on Independence Mall. And, you know, I think it's really interesting because that, that summit happened also in coordination with the Thousand Points of Light, which will be part of this, um, the Boys and Girls Club and uh, various interests that are going to be feeding into this new human capital finance um, out of school time learning school programs. And so this was the year after the Federal Communications uh, Telecommunications Act was passed and E-rate was brought into the schools and libraries in terms of discounted wired access. And so really 1997 was the last 
you know, cohort of kids that didn't live in a fully digitally immersed world. And so the fact that like, it makes me wonder why George Romney had this ask, you know, had this desire to have this summit and what it meant in the time. Um, and so I was looking a little bit into his background, which I wasn't familiar with, but he actually started out um, his family, they were members of the church uh, in Mexico, uh, his grandfather, and then during the Mexican Revolution, they were forced out and they relocated. And um, early on in his career, he worked, um, his father-in-law uh, was with the Federal Radio Commission. So he had ties to this Federal Radio Commission, which again, a lot of this is about frequency. And then he moved on and he became a lobbyist for Alcoa. Now, Alcoa, as we know, like with the, the aluminum, there are a lot of questions about the impacts of aluminum on people's health and, and, you know, mental status and in injection technologies and various things with Alcoa and the aluminum aspect. So the fact that he was quite a prominent lobbyist for Alcoa for a number of years, and then he moved on to become sort of a key uh, uh, labor leader in the auto industry, which I guess I knew he was governor of Michigan, but I didn't understand that it came out of labor organizing in the auto industry. And, and that, again, was one of the earliest industries to become automated. And, and they did it in a very sneaky ways, is that they would automate, um, you know, which makes sense, they would automate the most dangerous jobs, like that they would automate um, the paint shops, which were the worst jobs, but often those were the jobs they also forced on the black workers. And and then those were increasingly automated out of, you know, out of work. So it wasn't just the paint shop. It was all aspects of fabrication. And, and now we're, we're reaching whole new levels of automation. So, um, you know, I think that gives a, a broad sense of sort of the government background of what's going on in Utah. We have a lot of people who are very concerned about the education system. I would say right now there's a lot of concern coming from parents and community members around social emotional learning and also the critical race theory. And I would say I understand the concerns around perceptions of indoctrinating children in the classrooms. I also know that a lot of these uh, approaches are meant to sort of create inflammatory sy sy systems that actually distract people from the real rollout, which is the competency-based education model. And Utah is pursuing the competency model. Clearly, they're pursuing it on higher education. And so while they keep people busy, focused on social emotional learning and critical race theory, they're actually going to be able to put in the blockchain digital identity badging programs that are going to be much, much worse. And so I would say also those other two issues are liable to feed into data gathering for impact investment. So Again, we want children to feel cared for. We want communities that have been oppressed to be acknowledged, but the way in which it's all being carried out is being done in a way to divide people and to distract people from the larger programs, which is literally digitizing your government on a smartphone as they're doing in Ukraine. Or those, those are the plans before such broke out. And then um, you know, shifting children into this um, digital wallet metaverse world. And so, you know, Utah is in the crux of it. Maybe not as much as Colorado or Texas, but definitely leading. And, and I think, again, the, the, the culture here of good works definitely feeds into the social impact finance space. The fact that both the good works and the fact that the church itself is, holds so many resources that they're going to be channeling in and essentially turning vulnerable populations into batteries to turn these impact deals.